fucking good. All you'll ever be. If I were to ask you what was the most powerful and influential movie studio in cinematic history, you'd instantly think of the Hollywood big guns like 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, or Disney. But you'd be wrong. The real answer is Shaw Brothers, a Hong Kong studio that had its heyday in the late 1960s and early 70s. Like the Big Five back in the Hollywood studio era, Shaw Brothers owned all their own 24-hour-a-day studio spaces, post-production facilities and distribution centers, had cast and crew under strict contract, churned out films at a breakneck pace, and even owned many of its own movie theaters and amusement parks. At its headquarters in Clearwater Bay, Shaw Brothers even maintained permanent housing for its workers, actors, and directors, as well as training schools for both acting and martial arts. In its prime, this one studio had a virtual monopoly over not just Hong Kong, but also the entire Southeast Asian market, with no other film company capable of competing with it. However, the Shaw Brothers' monopoly was eventually threatened by one of its own, Raymond Chow, who left the company in 1970 to form his own studio, Golden Harvest, which signed Bruce Lee, who would quickly become the greatest martial arts film star of all time. Lee helped Golden Harvest achieve unprecedented box office success in Hong Kong, but this didn't immediately mark the end of Shaw Brothers' dominance, as the older studio continued to be a driving force in Hong Kong's cinema, striving to use its mastery of the old Hollywood model to spread Chinese culture and sensibilities to all corners of the globe. But by the mid-70s, with Golden Harvest inspiring other small studios to rise up and compete, Shaw Brothers knew it needed to branch out and try new things. Thus, in 1975, with the aim to copy the success of large-scale special effects films from other countries, Shaw Brothers released the first-ever Chinese superhero film. Ancient monsters have emerged from the depths of a glacial volcano and are menacing the world under orders of their twisted leader, Princess Dragon Mom. At the front lines of the attack, Science Headquarters devises a plan to create a super-powered bionic hero capable of taking on the enemy. One of their best officers, Rema, volunteers to undergo the painful procedure to become Inframan, the only thing standing in the way of Princess Dragon Mom and her evil minions. In the mid-70s, Japanese science fiction featured a few prominent superheroes like Aiji Tsuburaya's Ultraman and Toei's Kamen Rider, both of which were wildly popular in Hong Kong. Shaw Brothers moguls Run Mei and Run Lun Shaw decided to capitalize on this by putting a Hong Kong spin on the genre with a thinly veiled take on Ultraman called, in rough English translation, the Chinese Superman. To write the script, they hired Ni Kong, a prolific screenwriter and novelist who had worked for Shaw Brothers before, as well as for Golden Harvest, where he wrote the Bruce Lee hit Fist of Fury, though he wasn't credited at the time. Directing duties then went to Hua Shan, a cinematographer who had recently transitioned into directing but would later become famous for the wonderfully absurd Kung Fu Zombie. Hua Shan believed in the Shaw Brothers' ethos of representing Chinese values and cultures, regardless of genre or subject matter, and his primary goal was to make a movie beloved by Chinese audiences both young and old. He also wanted to take what he'd learned from working on the international Shaw co-productions The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires and Cleopatra Jones and the Casino of Gold You nearly blew up half of Hong Kong. And I may blow up the other half before I'm through. and turn that into a visually exciting spectacle. He also utilized storyboards to track the action and cinematography, a technique never used at Shaw Brothers before. Hey, do you have a sci-fi classic you want me to cover? 
drop it down in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, please consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you still haven't gotten enough of me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heat and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more science fiction classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. To play the lead of Inframan slash Rema, Shaw turned to Danny Lee, a reliable actor who was used to being in some of the studio's more experimental works. He was proficient in both judo and karate, which were seen as the best fit for working in a full-body costume, and he also knew how to ride a motorcycle. Lee would go on to have a long and distinguished career both with and without Shaw Brothers, even forming his own production company and developing a fruitful partnership with Chow Yun-Fat, culminating in John Woo's The Killer. The two female villains, Princess Dragon Mom and She-Demon, are played by Terry Liu and Dana Shum, respectively, both known for starring in a few of Shaw's more erotic and exploitative films, like The Bamboo House of Dolls. Another actor worth mentioning is the one playing the sergeant, Bruce Le. No, not Bruce Lee, this one only has one E in his surname. Without getting into the long and sordid history of Bruce exploitation, I'll just say that Bruce Le was one of the more famous and successful actors who took advantage of a rough physical similarity to the late Kung Fu superstar. After two months of pre-production, filming took place from January to April 1975. Shaw Brothers brought in camera equipment from Hollywood, such as rear projectors, blue screens, and more elaborate compositing gear, and hired a few Japanese technicians to help with the special effects, like Michio Mikami, who had worked on Godzilla, Rodan, and most importantly, Kamen Rider. Twenty different so-called glacier monsters were initially envisioned for the film, and twelve had suits built, though only seven actually appear in the final film. The plant monster, the spider monster, the long-haired monster, the fire dragon, the iron armor monsters, the mutant drill, and Princess Dragon Mom's winged dragon form, in addition to the skeleton ghosts who act as the basic enemy foot soldiers. The titular Inframan went through several different iterations as well, as did his motorcycle, which in early scripts had missiles, bombs, and a machine gun attached to it. Though these were nixed over safety concerns, the film still makes liberal use of pyrotechnics, which resulted in several accidents that luckily only singed a few actors and scorched a few costumes. After an extensive, over-the-top marketing campaign, Inframan released in Hong Kong on August 1st, 1975. Despite the incredible hype and the popularity of tokuzatsu television series in Hong Kong, the movie was considered a major disappointment for Shaw Brothers, only barely earning its budget back. Plans for a sequel were immediately scrapped. However, at that year's Cannes Film Festival, the movie was prominently offered along with a handful of other Shaw pictures for an international release. Their horror and exploitation distributor Joseph Brenner picked it up, had one of the most deliciously terrible English language dubs made for it. Your daughter will die unless you agree. In ten seconds, I want an answer. Now listen to me. I've already thought about it. I'll never do what you want. And released it in America, where it was surprisingly successful, both commercially and critically. Roger Ebert famously gave it a glowing review that he would later retroactively change to be even more positive. And Inframan is nowadays considered a cult classic in the West. Still, it didn't become a franchise in any meaningful way, and though Shaw would try again to make an effects heavy film with 1977's The Mighty Peking Man, the Hong Kong market just wasn't ready for something like Inframan until many years later. Now, even though I've pretended to know what I'm talking about when it comes to Chinese cinema and martial arts movies in particular, my knowledge is almost entirely surface level. Therefore, to talk more intelligently on the matter, I've invited my buddy Tristan, aka the martial arts film freak, to give his much more knowledgeable thoughts on Inframan. 
While I am Eric's kung fu expert for this job, I must say that I am also quite a big fan of tokusatsu. I think it's pretty cool. So it is as a martial arts and tokusatsu fan that I gratefully accept this job. However, to truly discuss Super Inframan, I need to give a bit of a history lesson on what was going on with Hong Kong Kung Fu Cinema and the whole scene around this time period. Kung Fu Cinema fans have a collective fondness for two major studios in Hong Kong, Golden Harvest and Shaw Brothers Studios. These two studios give a certain promise of entertainment and quality, but we're just going to kick Golden Harvest out of here and talk about this beautiful bastard right here. Shaw Brothers Studios has provided over 50 years of wonderful films to the world, but they weren't always seen as one of the best sources of kung fu action. Just like any major studio in Hollywood or anywhere around the world, Shaw Brothers would pivot to what was most popular for the time. And in the 1960s, Shaw Brothers hit it big with kung fu flicks starring two huge stars, Chang Pei Pei and Jimmy Wang Yu. The two would star in legendary films like Golden Swallow, Come Drink With Me, The One-Armed Swordsman, The Sword and the Loot, and many more. These films featured a style of choreography that was much slower, consisted of a lot of traditional kung fu and a lot of pausing to accentuate the shapes being made by their arms, their limbs, and the whole choreography in general. This is a subgenre of kung fu cinema that fans today call shapes movies. It derived from traditional Peking opera and was very popular for the time, until someone sort of gummed up the works. Just as Eric said, Raymond Chow broke from Shaw Brothers Studios and created his own in Golden Harvest. They saw great success early on with the wonderful Angela Mao in her own starring vehicles like Lady Whirlwind and When Taekwondo Strikes. You know, she was the sister in Enter the Dragon. But it's the signing of Bruce Lee and Bruce's first film, The Big Boss, becoming the highest grossing film in Hong Kong at the time that really started to change the game. Bruce's movies were different. Bruce refused to conform to the Peking opera style choreography that many films were doing at the time, just about all of the films were doing at the time. The industry heavyweights, the industry veterans held this style very dear to their hearts. Even Bruce's own director on The Big Boss, the director who also played the villain of this film, was very much against what Bruce was trying to do. But when the film becomes the highest grossing film in Hong Kong at that time, not even Shaw Brothers could ignore it. And just like I said, Shaw Brothers was known to pivot towards a trend every now and again. Post Bruce Lee, Hong Kong cinema saw a massive shift across the landscape in many different ways. But one way that fans could see that on screen was in the choreography. Shaw Brothers started leaning into Bruce's philosophy of realistic fight scenes. Shaw Brothers' action started having a speed and intensity and an aggressive attitude that films of the 1960s just did not have. Just take a look back at those films and compare them to what was going on in just 1972, only one year after The Big Boss, and films like The Boxer from Shantung. <laughs> and Four Riders. truly displayed how much influence Bruce Lee had. Just one year after Bruce Lee's Hong Kong re-debut, and the biggest studio in town starts playing catch-up. I say re-debut because Bruce Lee was a child actor before coming to America in 1959. I give this history lesson because it's important when talking about Super Inframan. Eric talked a bit about Shaw Brothers wanting to follow the success of effects-heavy films of Hollywood and the effects-heavy tokusatsu films of Japan. But this history lesson also shows that they weren't just chasing foreign trends. They also had trends to chase back home in Hong Kong. Super Inframan tackled the challenge of handling the new style of action quite well. All of the action shines, but it is that finale 20 minutes that truly sends the crowd home happy. The brawl outside of the villain's lair includes some crisp striking from Bruce Lay, a popular Bruce Bloitation star at the time. It's a scene that brings to mind the wonderful film Heroes 2. And when the titular Inframan makes his way inside of the lair, we truly see what martial arts cinema was known for. 
the hero finding himself outnumbered and against impossible odds, only to beat down every single one of them one by one with iron fists and kung fu kicks. This is Inframan at his and the movie's best, in my opinion. I'm a big sci-fi nerd, I truly am, but as a martial arts nerd, just seeing the hero take everyone down with his martial ability alone just makes this ending pure gold. Super Inframan still has a certain flair to the chaos that screams Shaw Brothers, and you want it to. You don't watch a Spielberg movie to see elements of Wes Anderson. You want to hear the Spielberg notes in the music. Just like you don't watch a Shaw Brothers to see elements of Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, or Bruce Lee. Shaw Brothers just plays a certain kind of music that hits the soul in its own kind of way. But on that same note, there is something about Inframan that just strays a little too far from home for me. And I think it did for audiences around this time as well. Shaw Brothers films of this variety didn't seem to stay very long. Within the coming years of Shaw Brothers, you have the meteoric rise of the Venoms mob, guys who put out films like The Five Deadly Venoms, Scribbled Avengers, or The Kid with the Golden Arm. It's a great movie. And of course, the meteoric eruption of director and choreographer Lau Kar Lung, bringing us the wonderful talent of Gordon Liu to the world with films like 36 Chamber of Shaolin, Heroes of the East, Martial Club, and the always excellent The Eight Diagram Pole Fighter. A return to old school shapes films for Shaw Brothers. And for many, it's considered the best period of Shaw Brothers cinema period from the late 70s to the early 80s. These are the films that when I think Shaw Brothers Studios, they hit home for me. Kung Fu and martial arts cinema as a whole doesn't often travel into the realm of science fiction, but whenever it does, there's always fun to be had. Truly only about three to five films come to mind, and Super Inframan is one of the earliest examples. I suppose that it is up to Eric as to whether or not Super Inframan is a sci-fi classic or not. However, I can confirm that Super Inframan, in all of its tokusatsu insanity, truly is a kung fu classic. I'll go ahead and give Eric his video back now. Bye! Thanks, Tristan. If you want more martial arts content, you should definitely check out his channel. I've got a list of like a hundred movies I want to watch just from his recommendations. As for my opinion on Inframan, I'll keep it brief. This feels like the Saturday morning cartoons I grew up with, like a kung fu infused He-Man mixed with some old school pulp sci-fi. There's nothing to really analyze here, as the movie doesn't have time for broad themes, morals, or subtext. It's a whirlwind action movie from beginning to end, with only a handful of short pauses for basic character development or plot exposition. Sometimes it moves so fast it skips over important plot developments like Inframan going from entering the enemy base to already being captured within. I don't mean any of that to be negative. Far from it. This movie makes me feel like a kid again, which as far as I'm concerned is a monumental achievement. The look, design, and execution of the film is insane in the best possible way, and the zany English language dub only adds to its awesomeness. No, it doesn't really make much sense, and no, it didn't stunt Shaw Brothers' eventual decline, but it still broke new ground and went all in on its vision. Therefore, I can't help but consider Inframan an endlessly entertaining sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What are some of your favorite sci-fi martial arts movies? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, please remember to punch those like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching, and until next time, when we'll see what happens when LA gets flooded with a new kind of immigrant, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody.